just a moment. And I want to invite the Chief Executive Officer of EIT Climate Kit, Kirsten Dunlop, to the stage. She has over 30 years experience in systemic transformations in areas such as academia, consulting, banking, and insurance across the world. She serves on many advisory boards and is recognized as a leader at the European Commission Economic and Societal Impact Research and Innovation, that's ESER, expert group. She holds a PhD in cultural history from the University of East Anglia and a bachelor's degree in art history from the University of Sydney and is a specialist in experiential learning and cross-disciplinary practice. Kristen. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. I am simply going to make a small announcement with respect to how this first panel will play out. We will have a discussion here this morning about the importance of intervening and working in partnership and working in partnership to connect many pieces of the puzzle together. And a discussion about Ireland in the world, the role of food systems, of the farming community, of transformation and move to sustainable bioeconomy. But we're first going to open with an, uh, a short presentation from Minister Martin Hayden, who is, has been, was going to be here this morning, but has been called to parliamentary business, and will be talking to us about the critical role of innovation as a driver of sustainability. So I'm going to suggest that we start with that. We'll hear from Minister Hayden now, and then we'll invite the first panel up and begin a discussion, picking up on many of the points that he will be making, also very relevant to a recent address internationally with respect to Ireland's role in the world. So, over to Minister Hayden. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to firstly congratulate you, Kirsten, and your colleagues in Climate uh, Kick uh, on this fantastic event uh, that has been held here. And I want to apologize for not being able to be with you in person, which was my intention um, initially. Um, but I, I, I have no doubt you're gonna have a, a really insightful discussion uh, over the course of today. Uh, I would also like to particularly welcome our Slovenian and Basque colleagues to Dublin. It's wonderful to have you here and I hope you enjoy uh, all of the proceedings. Just last week, the United Nations General Assembly in New York saw world leaders adopt a political declaration to accelerate action to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. They aim to drive economic prosperity and well-being for all people while protecting the environment. They include, of course, ambitions around addressing climate change, but also issues like reaching zero hunger in the world by 2030. In the context of a growing global population and warming of our uh, climate, we urgently need to optimally and sustainably produce food to achieve these. Therefore, the question is one of how we meet the competing demands concerning nature, land use, and ensuring our food production systems produce fewer emissions while being able to sustainably produce food to feed the world's growing population. For me, the answer is simple, it's innovation. We have done this down through the years. We are applying more science, research and innovation in how our food production systems um, operate than ever before to ensure not only that we continue to produce food, but also that we do so more sustainably. To set the scene for this session, I would like to talk to you about the Irish government's policy on climate change. Ireland has committed to a 51% reduction in emissions by 2030 and mirroring the EU commitment, net zero emissions by 2050. As part of this effort, the government has implemented a legislative framework to ensure delivery. There are spe specific target reductions for each sector of the economy and accordingly specific actions supported by policy to ensure emissions are reducing across all sectors. We all know that agriculture, uh, the agriculture sector is a particularly challenging area when it comes to reducing emissions. We in Ireland are particularly challenged because on the one hand, agriculture is a vital part of our economy, being our oldest and most important indigenous sector, but it is also responsible for a significant um, amount of our emissions. However, it is also a sector where significant progress can be made in reducing emissions through changes in farming practices and through the adoption of new technologies, which in many instances can be actually cost beneficial for farmers. And where there is a cost to the farmer, uh, that is where the state and downstream private entities can step in to support farmers. Accordingly, the Irish government's policy on climate change in the agriculture sector 
is focused on promoting sustainable farming practices that allow farmers to produce top quality, safe, nutritious food with a lower emissions output and improve water quality trend and lower impact on biodiversity. We are in effect empowering farmers with a science-based approach, which is backed by robust science and research. As a result, the agriculture sector is in a period of evolution and this transformation is being guided by the Food Vision 2030 strategy. It takes a food systems approach to how we produce our food. It is cognizant of our environmental obligations, but is cognizant of sustainability in all of its forms, including the economic sustainability of the farmer and the societal sustainability of the rural or coastal community in which he or she lives. That strategy also called out the need for new innovative approaches involving non-traditional partners for advancing climate action and led to the collaboration with Climate Kick that is the focus of this breakout session. Achieving these goals will require change and changing practices will require a shift in mindset and a willingness to embrace new approaches. I do not under underestimate how difficult this will be, but I am confident in the same way that the sector has adapted since joining the EEC and through various reforms such as Fischler and Maastricht, that it will continue to evolve. And in the same way that we don't farm exactly how we did 10 years ago, um, we will farm very differently in 10 years time also. The Irish government is committed to working with the sector. This includes providing guidance and support to farmers to help them to adopt the new practices, as well as working with industry and the research and innovation community to produce and promote new, technological, uh, new technologies and practices. We are fortunate to have available to us the education, research and advisory network and research capabilities of Ireland's Agriculture and Food Development Authority, Chagas, and our higher education institutions, such as UCD, to support us on this agri-climate journey. With that in mind, we will be hosting an important national conference on November 15th at the Aviva Stadium, which will bring together the whole sector to hear the latest on the research around agriculture, land use and climate. We will be announcing more details very soon. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Ireland wants to become a world leader in sustainable food systems over the next decade. This ambition necessitates a transition pathway that is credible, that is innovative, and which will bring all stakeholders with us. The seven flagship projects identified in the Irish Deep Demonstration Partnerships are examples of these transition pathways. And your contributions here today can further develop those pathways. So I'm pleased to be able to share our journey with you all here today, and I wish you very well in all of your deliberations over the course of, of the day. Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. So with that, I'd like to invite the two panellists for this session who are with us in the room, and John Bell, who will be joining us online. Uh, and we'll start a conversation to translate some of this into the living system of what's happening. Welcome. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce today three panelists um, to discuss, really to take a topic that sounds very abstract and bring it to life in terms of what it means for Ireland, what it means on the ground, what it means in terms of the next decades of action. We have with us today John Bell, joining us from Brussels, Director for Healthy Planet in the Directorate General, Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Welcome, John. Good morning. We have Kevin O'Connor, who is Professor of Applied Microbiology and Microtechnology and the director of the Biorbic Bioeconomy SFI Research Centre at University College Dublin. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks very much for having me, Kirsten. And we have Patrick Barrett, who is working with DAFM, Agriculture Inspector of Bioeconomy, Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation Systems, and Agri-Digitalization. Thank you very much. And Kirsten, how are you? Very well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we've we thought we might start this uh, conference and the discussions here really unpacking a little bit this question of what it means to take a systemic approach and to use the terminology systems innovation, the idea of deep demonstration, and what it means for Ireland in the world, what it means for food systems, and what it means in terms of what's happening here. This is about livelihoods. 
ultimately, it's really about livelihoods. We're at a very tricky moment in the world, a moment of increasing tensions, increasing polarization, increasing fear and uncertainty. And food, food systems, agricultural production, our ways of thinking about land and land use are right at the heart of that. Food and water are at the very, very heart of creating a sustainable global society, as you heard Frank open with this morning. Because food and food systems and our land use, our identities in relationship to land, set a culture, set the system, determine who we are and how we live. So here the challenge is, how do we create a world in which 10 billion people can thrive? And what role does Ireland have to play in doing that? And the other member states across Europe, Spain, the Basque Country, and Slovenia, and many of the partners with whom we're working. We know there are massive challenges globally in terms of food production, food security, food stability, massive challenges in terms of how that transition to sustainable farming bioeconomy practices, also bringing back many of the traditional practices that in fact might help us, deep knowledge and understanding of land, integrating that into our future economies. Agricultural emissions represent massive opportunities also to build economies of the future and to build societies for the future. And that's what we want to discuss, because this is not so much about the individual elements that we begin to understand, but how to pull them all together. So I'd like to start with you, John, if you wouldn't mind, really helping us think about this in a context, in a context around what's happening globally in Europe, in Ireland, from the perspective of your responsibility of a healthy planet, why have we not got this sorted already? Why is transition to sustainable food systems and sustainable land practices and agriculture not a walk in the park? Why is it difficult? Uh, thanks a million, uh, uh, Kirsten, and good morning, Belfield. We're at a situation which is probably unique in human history where we understand our dilemma and we have a number of tipping points, uh, as Suzanne has said. Um, and we have uh, in the food system, probably the critical uh, economic, social and uh, community and trade life support system upon which everything will depend. So we're no longer at a point where we're trying to work out you know, the specificity of what is happening in our climate or our weather or our water or our biodiversity or our invasive species or any of the things that were uh, unknowns uh, a decade ago. We're in a situation going, how are we going to get from here to there? And I think to begin with, I think there's great credit in what uh, Minister Hayden has uh, identified, the willingness uh, to try something uh, that is both connected to communities and knowledge and deep demonstration uh, you mentioned Ireland in terms of the Food Vision Initiative to try and make Ireland uh, the green heart of the Green Deal is what somebody said for the island of Ireland to build a bioeconomy action plan. And in a place like UCD it is to make the university community as lighthouses as part of this bridging with communities and knowledge, I think is something we should say at the beginning uh, deserves to be welcomed. Um, why is, it, why is it taking so long? Well, you know, we started this conversation 2015 in Expo. This is a, a nanosecond in terms of uh, European integration processes. And what we see is, is an acceptance that there needs to be systemic change. Why is systemic change dif difficult, particularly in food systems? And if we can do it in food systems, by the way, we can do it in any of the other systems that need to change. We need systemic change because most of our assumptions, most of our frameworks, uh, whether they're economic, social, uh, technological, or environmental, um, can no longer be taken for granted. And the systems cannot work based on the old assumptions. Food systems are complex. Food systems, I mean, complex, if you look at the European Environment Agency's report last year, you know, just policy coherence in itself is an extraordinary challenge. Food systems are deep. They're rooted in communities. They're rooted in real places. They're rooted in places we talk, it's great to have Spain and Slovenia, the Basque country here. Places have very different challenges and needs, but the people who work and develop the food systems are central to this, and community has to be central to that. But most of our um, policy systems don't have the kind of multi-level governance that you need to connect strategic goals with local communities and, and ownership. And of course, food systems are existential. 
you know, if we don't get the car of the future quite right here or there, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, but if our food systems aren't functioning because of water or biodiversity or pollution, or because our rural communities don't see a rural regeneration future for them, that's quite difficult. So what we need to do is not simply to look at systems as a whole and how they should work and what they should do, but the how question here, and this is why deep demonstration is extremely important. There's a lack of trust in the system almost everywhere, and we need to build trust through demonstration. And the demonstration has to be deep in the sense that it has to be linking knowledge and communities and knowledge to communities specific challenges. If we look at climate protection, for example, these are very different challenges if you're on an island in the west of Europe and, and whether you're in, in, in the Basque region or in the main part of Spain or in Slovenia. We need to be able to have forms of deliberation. This is where the deep comes in. There need to be new ways of getting the knowledge into the hands of people who need to use the knowledge and deploy the knowledge and decision making that is both connected to local communities and generational in that what it will set out is a destination point that is something that can mobilize future. So what does our countryside in, in Ireland, for example, what does our countryside look like in 20 or 30 years time? What do the communities look like, the value systems, the economics and so forth? And the third D I would put down is distribution. There are very, very big decisions to be made if the, if the markets and the pricing systems that actually will dictate what people do start to internalize the externalities in the next few years. So are we going to put the right price on what, for example, the farming community do for us in terms of ecosystem services or water provision or biodiversity and all the rest? And how will the effects be distributed? And this is where some of the work you'll hear about from um, uh, Kevin O'Connor and Patrick in the bioeconomy, where we're looking to bring the biosphere and the economy together in a way which allows also the economic problem to be fixed, where there's an actual reasonable distribution um, of resources and economics. So there's, it's, it's also a great moment of opportunity. And the opportunity, not just for Ireland to be the green heart of the Green Deal, and maybe the island of Ireland to be a, a test bed for that. But why wouldn't Europe be the world's leading sustainable food system? And what would, we, what would our responsibility be to our neighbours around the world with the knowledge that we have? I'll stop there. Thank you very much, John. So why, how, why does Europe and the world need a sustainable food system and how to do that? That sense of opportunity, Kevin, you've been working right at the heart of new solutions, research into practice, applied technologies, ways of finding solutions that are not just technical solves, but also open up new market opportunities and a way of connecting sustainable living with sustainable new visions. What's your sense of how research and innovation drives this transformation? How does it really support transformation in the timeframes we need and at the scale we need? Yeah, thanks very much. A very difficult question to open with. Um, so I, I think, as John has said, it's very complex, um, but it's about bringing people together. So you have entrepreneurs, you have est established industries, you have innovation, you have research, and they all speak different languages. And so the first thing is actually creating a space where people can actually work together. Um, and it's also about respect. Um, because, you know, even within the world of academia, um, people speak different languages. You then move outside and you see that people see a problem very, very differently. Some people will see that from a social perspective. Um, and I've said this before, uh, the bioeconomy you've mentioned itself, it's about... Uh, it's about community and it's about family when it really boils down to it, yeah? Whether you're in industry, whether you're in academia, if you're in this area, you're trying to create a sustainable future. So create the space, give people the opportunity to speak, to listen, to learn, um, and then really try to understand the problem, yeah? So as a technologist, and I, I'm a technologist, I, I like to be busy developing technologies. But the solution to sustainability isn't technological alone. It's also social. Um, and so you need to create a space for the social entrepreneurs. You need to create a space uh, for people who are looking at the problem from a, a community base. Um, so there, are, there is a huge amount of tacit knowledge that people have. So it's not about people like myself as an academic telling people who are in practice what the solutions are. It's about 
having that conversation. And so, for example, Farm Zero C is a project that is funded by Science Foundation Ireland, and also uh, we're getting funding from DAFM as well to expand that project from the Department of Agriculture. Um, and we have industry through Carberry, who are a dairy processor, but we have farmer cooperatives, we have a demonstration farm, we have people who are interested in technology, we have people who want to understand the social aspects uh, of what impact uh, um, changing practices on the farm is. We have farmers telling us, that'll never work, don't, don't try that, yeah? or that's been tried 20 years ago, or they're actually telling us, we're doing this, you're coming with the idea, but I've been doing that for five years, come and visit my farm. So it's about having an open mind, it is about, as I said, creating the space and then learning. And the key is about translating knowledge. At the end, what you want as an output is to say, okay, the knowledge is going to actually go into practice in these kind of deep demonstrators. And I think, you know, we have Lions Farm and UCD, which is doing great work uh, in, um, in uh, academic excellence. And it's about taking that then and translating it into farms. And we're collaborating with, for example, Tommy Boland uh, out in uh, Lions Farm. And Tommy has loads of ideas about how do I take now something that I've been developing for 10 and 15 years, how do I actually now bring that out uh, onto farms? So it's about linking up the various stakeholders and then translating. That's a very long-winded answer now, but... <laughs> but it's very important. I was in, uh, in New York last week with the Climate Week and the UN SG, uh, SDG Summit. And in fact, landscapes, land use, and farming and agricultural practices were right at the core of some of the most vivid debates. And one of the key elements that was being discussed is the fact that everybody talks about systems change. Everybody talks about systems transformation. It's supposed to be systemic. But who is actually doing that? A very few. And this is one of the rare areas in the world with a government with the courage and the vision to say, so we're going to try this. But I think it would be super helpful to hear what is your sense of why does it matter so much to take the plunge to work in much more integrated ways, not in a haphazard way, but in a very, very deliberately constructed and supported way, like John was referring to this notion of demonstrations and deep. Those two words mean a thing. Really show what's possible and make it deep. But it'd be really interesting to see what, what do you think is the value of working in that integrated way? Why does it make a difference and how does it help overcome barriers? So um, <clears throat> it's a very good question, Kirsten. And there's probably, from the Department of Agriculture's perspective, probably a little bit of a backstory to how we've got here. And there was a review undertaken around agri-food innovation for the preparation of the current uh, agri-food strategy, Food Vision 2030. And it was led by a group of independent experts. And I was part of the group that supported that, that expert group. And we were part of interviews with farmers, um, farmer representative groups, advisors, agri-food processors, people who support agriculture through, through finance, the research community. Basically, the whole system in Ireland was interviewed over a period of 12 to 15 months. And a report was produced led by a person called Paul Finnerty. And the minister took on this report and he asked uh, the people in the Department of Agriculture to take on board the, the reflections in that report, which says, we're investing a lot of money on the public side in innovation. The private sector is also investing a lot of money in innovation. And really where we're getting to is a wall of knowledge and a wall of information but the gap to introducing that into action on the ground is a very long period of time. And what can we do about this? So Food Vision 2030, uh, as the minister has, has introduced um, and has set a direction, has a pillar or a mission on innovation, which says that Ireland wishes to take a challenge-based approach. It wishes to set up an innovation vision it wishes to have a dynamic knowledge exchange system, and it wishes to focus on key technologies, data, nature-based solutions, and new outlooks that can be introduced. And then we thought about all this, and we said, well, how are we going to do this? And um, I was introduced to Climate Kick at a, a, a climate finance event in Dublin, and myself and my colleagues, we had long conversations, and. Uh, we brought along uh, Andy Kerr at the time to meet Bill Callanan, and the department was very open to looking at the opportunity of 
the deep demonstration idea that Climate Kick had brought forward as a means of actually implementing innovation across many different pillars of activity, research, education, finance, uh, engaging with people, uh, scanning policy, scanning innovation globally, and looking to see what all this could do to help Ireland. So we entered into a, a partnership with Climate Kick, and this started in March 2022. So really what we have uh, come to the, to, to the view is that if you want to address a really uh, deep issue such as agri-climate action, you need to look across a whole set of what are termed levers of change. Now that's a quite a fancy term, but if you really look at it, it's all the tools that the likes of departments and our cross-government colleagues have to aid people on the ground to implement change in action in a way that they're given reassurance and they're given help. Maybe it's their, through their farm advisor, maybe it's through their agri-food pro processor, maybe it's through departmental schemes, that all these are adding up to aid them to be in a position where they're future-proofing their activities, because this is important. The, the role of farmers, the role of, of uh, farming organizations and agri-food processors and our food system, it's not just something that accumulates in a big city, it's something that takes place right across uh, Ireland and the island of Ireland and across the mass of Europe. And this is very important socially, it's very important economically, it has a huge importance in terms of sustainability. And also we have to take into account that it's different spatially, it means different things in different places and that all needs to be accounted for, and that's complex. So that's why you need an initiative like this, to complement already a lot of uh, initiatives that have been building up over time, the government's investment in, for example, Chagas, the government's investment in the higher education system, uh, the schemes that come through the CAP strategic plan, they are all deliberative actions to add up to a, to a brighter and a, big, and a better future but all these things need to be joined up and thought through, and that's where we are. Uh, the deep demonstration is part of that process. So this idea of joining up and thinking it through, it sounds easy, it's easy to say, it's dead difficult. Yes, absolutely. But the encouraging thing is that uh, in the structures of the deep demonstration project, we've set up a consultative group, which has 30 members. We've, uh, with our Climate Kick colleagues, who you know, do a lot of the heavy lifting on the ground day to day, um, we've run a whole series of workshops. Some of those workshops have been across the whole area of the, of the food system. Some of them have been sectorally based. But people have been really open to come and join these events. And that's been so encouraging because what you really see is the drive to find the answers. People really want to, I suppose, address sustainability. And they're, it's very interesting to see that they really view innovation as the driver of sustainability because it offers multiple opportunities. Uh, there's opportunities to develop uh, new products, new services, new applications. There's uh, opportunities to look at, um, I suppose, the way their company can evolve. It's, it offers an, a future-proofing opportunity and it allows them to really have an outlook for their, their, their stakeholders, their value chain. So they're really, really trying to think through all elements. And I think that's, that's probably been one of the, the warmest, uh, I suppose, things that have emerged out of this is, is the engagement of everybody. Well, that's very good news, very, very good news, especially because we really need that kind of sense of hope and possibility in this time in the world, and we need places where that's being played out. Gavin, can I come back to you for a second on this, the question of research innovation, the way innovation is driving this. Our experience as an organization working with hundreds of, organ of expert organizations, individual innovators, startups, entrepreneurs all over Europe is sometimes it can be a little bit of an ego game and sometimes it's hard to get people around the same table really working those integrated solutions. How do you see research and innovation acting to get to systemic outcomes? What's been your experience there? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll start, actually, I just, uh, some notes, but uh, maybe I'll start with uh, the difficult bit. The difficult bit about uh, systemic change is that you are consistently outside your comfort zone. Yeah. 
exactly. Yeah. So uh, where you have egos and you have people, oh, I'm an expert in this, etc. Uh, absolutely. And like, if you look at Farm Zero C, I'm not an expert. I'm the generalist. Uh, it's actually the people I work with who are the experts. Um, and sometimes you need maybe somebody like me who doesn't have enough knowledge, um, but it sees, okay, we have to do something here and encourage the experts to come together. Um, so when you're innovating, you're generally failing, you're generally making mistakes, you generally don't have enough money, you generally can't get everybody to buy into your vision, um, there's an awful lot of pain, but you have to stick to it. You have to stick and stick and stick, and you meet, there's, the easiest thing in the world is to say no. Yeah. no that'll never work. Yeah, no, that's just impossible. Uh, because people see you pushing a very large rock, rock up a very steep hill. But that's what is needed. Yeah, I think people have to be ready uh, on the journey. Day one, enthusiasm, but day 100, day 1,000, uh, you have to stay uh, to the task. So I think, I think that's really important. And also, it's not a them and us. Mm. Yeah, I think this is one of the problems, is that uh, you have people who see change as a great thing, but you have also people who see th change as a very bad thing. Yeah? And people are afraid. People are afraid that change will bring maybe a, a worse outcome. Um, so, but then it's about, again, creating that space, giving people an opportunity, helping people to understand. It's not about preaching. It's not about, you know, I have all the knowledge, and if you listen to me, everything will be fine, uh, because that's not how it works. Nobody has uh, the, the answer. There is no silver bullet. It is a range of different things that we have to do. So if you want systemic change, you have to involve all, stakeholder, all stakeholders meaningfully. Yeah, so you can easily say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm chatting to a few farmers there, and sure, they're grand. Uh, you really have to listen. You have to engage, uh, park the egos, understand that uh, nobody has a monopoly on, on the knowledge. Um, but it's also about coordination. Yeah, it's really, really important to be able to show people that there is a destination, that we're going somewhere, and that is the path, that we're not going to jump from here to the destination immediately, that we're actually going to make a change. But you have to put the structures in place in order to create the systemic change. Yeah? Uh, so if people see that this is a bit chaotic and you know, I don't know where this is going, uh, then they won't buy in. Yeah? And if you have people who are enthusiasts, they'll find it difficult to buy in. So what about the people who are the cynics? Mm. Yeah? So you really have to, you have to create that. And I think you know, sometimes you have to keep banging on the door as well, because people uh, don't get your vision or don't understand it. Um, but clarity, simplicity, these are really important things in order to achieve uh, systemic change. And you are bringing people on a journey, and we've said it again, it is about jobs, it is about community, um, but it's also about resilience. And we talked about opportunities, and there are several opportunities, but those opportunities can only be realized if you are, are showing people a path towards those opportunities. So that, that's really, really important. So um, people will think, okay, what is it? It's ag tech, we've heard ag tech mentioned before. Um, it's about sustainable products, but to me it's about knowledge. If you empower people with knowledge, they feel they can do something. And I think that's a real concern, like you, you see it a lot in the media now. Young people feel overwhelmed by the lack of it's about pessimism, really, yeah? So they see, oh, the world is ending, there's no solutions, yeah? Um, it's, it's a very dark outcome. But what you have to do is you have to give them knowledge, you have to give them tools, but the system has to be ready to enable those people that now have the knowledge and the tools to implement, yeah? So it is very complex, it is very difficult, but that is about education, what we're doing in the universities, that is about industry, farming organizations buying into how we actually uh, tap in uh, to, uh, to that knowledge. And again, I've mentioned it before, it's not just about technology. Yeah? It is about social entrepreneurship. It is about uh, providing people with the opportunity that say, I can create a better society. And if you look at rural Ireland, that is about my community is graying, my community is leaving because there are no jobs, there's no future, people aren't going into agriculture. How do you transform that and say, hey, there are opportunities. There are opportunities in information, the Internet of Things, data, 
Yeah? This can actually create a vibrant rural community because people can actually say, well, I'm actually in IT, I'm actually in uh, the analysis of data, but I'm not based in the uh, financial center in the city, I'm actually based in rural Ireland or other rural communities. So I think that's really, really important. And resilience. If you see that agriculture is being beaten over the head saying you're a major problem, you're the cause of the problem, um, and people say, well, you know, how is my community going to be resilient? I see my community uh, collapsing. So, but resilience is about biodiversity, it's about soil health, it's about communities, it's about the sports clubs. So it is about technology, about sociology, and it's about economics. That's how you get systemic change. Just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, I think like one of the, the, <laughs> the fascinating things here is also, we were talking earlier this morning about the unexpected allies and the unexpected obstacles. It's often the people you'd think would be most open to change who are newcomers are the least, and those who have lived through so much change and transition on the ground are intrinsically more curious and more willing to bring that resilience through. So I think one of the things I would love to observe, and I'm going to come to you, John, next, this is a country that has experienced and has made change possible in an extraordinary, extraordinarily compressed period of time. And I, I was on a big discussion quite recently about Europe in the world and the extraordinarily challenging issues around geopolitical fragmentation, what's going on in terms of politics, divisions. And someone stood up and said, well, can we just remember that Europe has Ireland? And Ireland has shown the way on so many issues of huge social transition, reintegration, cohesion, and so on. And John, you mentioned Ireland is the green heart of the Green Deal. I'd love you to come back to that. How do you see Ireland's role in Europe? How do you think Europe can support Ireland in this transformation? And what would it take for Ireland to become a global leader in this space? Well, I maybe start from where you're sitting in Belfield. Um, when I left Belfield uh, in 1988, there was no science base. We exported uh, Guinness uh, cows and people um, we had one-fifth of the, of the labor force left in five years. There was a war raging uh, on the island, and there was a general sense of this, these were a series of impossible problems. And if, when I'm talking to young people now, I'm responsible for IPCC and climate and various other things here. When you talk to young people here, what Kevin said, you know, where's the hope? And you look at Ireland and you say, well, you know, twice in its recent history, recent being in the last hundred or so years, it's decided to reimagine something by having a clear mission and a clear, clear goal. So for my generation, our parents gave us the education at places like UCD. We went off and did different things. Many people came back knowing how to do things. And as, as, as both Patrick and Kevin have said, knowledge is absolutely critical to transition and putting knowledge in the hands of people in a form that it can be used for wise decision-making is critical. If, if I had said to my younger self in 1988, you know, here we would be sitting, you know, with peace on the island, with, you know, one of the most prosperous economies in the world, uh, with actually being asked the question about what our responsibility is to other parts of the world to, to do with these things, and letting aside, I mean, and Ireland has its problems, but letting aside uh, all of the other things that have changed in terms of people's ways of life and rights and everything else, I, I'd have been laughed at. Um, but the point was, at a certain point, if you take the, 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 we're in the business of making peace with nature. This is the way I try and simplify things. If you think about the peace process in Ireland, there was a common goal, there was a mobilization, there was a deep understanding and a listening and a learning, and there was a, you know, an application of the whole of society, not to a particular solution, but to working towards something. And that's what you're seeing uh, across the European Union, in a very short space of time across large parts of the world, that this is something that needs to be fixed, things that were, you know, at issue, leaving aside populism and so forth, things that were at issue, you know, three, four, five years ago are no longer at issue. So the question is how. I think the second inspirational point in Ireland is as a country that was formed by famine, it's the thing we don't really talk about, but within 10 or 15 years of the famine, uh, a whole generation of people in Ireland decided to reimagine what the future could look like. Um, agricultural cooperatives, sporting movements, language movements, theatre movements, you know, uh, you, you name it, reorganised the country, but it had a destination, a vision of what it could look like. And I think that's critical. This is why this mission approach that Patrick has mentioned, actually having clarity about what is the kind of destination that we want, and that has to integrate fairness 
um, and, 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 and distribution into that. That I think is, is where the hope comes from. Now we're struggling, all of us are struggling with all of the instruments and tools and processes and all that. So you can imagine what it's like sitting here. But in fact, we have invested in knowledge very prudently. Um, if you take, um, we've got the world's largest publicly funded uh, research program, Horizon uh, 2020 Horizon Europe, just to, on food, like for, we've now on Food 2030, which is I invite people to, maybe we have an event in, on, in December um, where we'll be drawing conclusions on that. We've been looking at food systems and research and innovation and pathways. How do we get from here to there? Um, we're, we, we have a, a, a bioeconomy uh, approach where we have public-private partnerships at EU level and in different parts of Europe, including Ireland, oh. Romania, different places, testing at scale, you know, what will the infrastructure of the future look like, which will have a massive impact on rural regeneration. And, and, and Kevin is a very important part of that. In, in Plovdiv in Bulgaria in, in October the 13th, we'll be discussing regional uh, innovation valleys for bioeconomy uh, and food systems. Um, we have an Irish presidency in 2026, which takes place at a critical moment when we're framing, you know, we're going to be 30 by 30 probably, you know, Ukraine, God willing, we will have a different shape to the European Union by 2030. We don't go around worrying about the fact that the boundary conditions are difficult. You know, as Jean Monnet said, the purpose of the European Union is to change the context and to use the levers that we have to do that. So Ireland's presidency in 2026 will be critical in terms of, you know, what is the budget for? How do we set direction? How do we organize things? And how do we, I think very importantly, when we have the knowledge and the demonstration, how do we accelerate it and scale it and replicate it and make it easy for people who want their communities uh, to do that? So um, I, I think there's a lot to be learned. And I think Ireland is taking its responsibilities. Um, I'm not often in the habit of, you know, sticking feathers in the caps of agriculture departments, but uh, I think people who are taking risks and people are taking risks to do these things. You don't change things without taking risks. And institutions like the European Commission or uh, the Department of Agriculture in Ireland, or even universities, we're in a risk averse culture. But if we're gonna to get to where we need to get to, we need to try and fail. We need to listen, we need to learn, we need to get things wrong, we need to move things forward. Um, and I think we'll, we'll find a way of doing that. But uh, I think those who are trying to do it on the island of Ireland in particular, I think there's an opportunity uh, at, at, at grassroots level, uh, on the island level, to test and demonstrate in what are effectively two jurisdictions but have m much in common um, how this could work at community level uh, and, and, and what can be brought. Um, as I always say when I'm, I'll stop talking now, science has to give um, courage to politics, hope to citizens, space to innovation and respite to nature. Um, and that's basically what we, what we are doing here in this conversation. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. So that critical importance of taking risk to avoid risk, because we know that what is at stake is just so critical. So I think we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience. Anyone who has some, a question they'd particularly like to put forward at this point in time? I'm going to keep asking questions, if not. in lines uh, next month. And it's just the question I had, sorry, I tried to scribble it down here, so bear with me. Um, it's kind of addressing what you were saying, Patrick, about the, the levers of change and those people who are touch points maybe in a farmer's life. And, and how do we encourage consistency of messaging across these levers of change and with particular um, focus on maybe uh, agri-adjacent stakeholders that, a farmer, that's ver that are very important in a farmer's life. So maybe their banker, their accountant, um, their vet, their mechanic, like they all will have an influence on, 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 on their decision making, more so maybe than, than an advisor, and trying to encourage consistency of messaging across those, those different professions that touch a farmer, something that could be seen as a, a difficult thing to do, so they're getting the right information from everybody, not just from their advisor. Well, that's a fantastic question. Patrick, do you want to take that? Yes, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, and I, th I think we're lucky is that people are already thinking about this. Um, 
So in the common agricultural policy and in each member state's CAP strategic plan, so this applies to Ireland as much to Slovenia, as much to Spain or, or, or the Spanish regions, um, there has been a call out for uh, member states to develop their agricultural knowledge and innovation system. It's shortened for ACUS, and essentially that tries to join up the dots between uh, research, the farm advisory system, um, with uh, innovation opportunities, and with delivering of uh, information and knowledge to the end user as quick as possible. But that needs joint up think thinking because all the people within that system need to sort of, I suppose, take the direction that the policy and the strategies and the messages from Europe are setting uh, and, and are, is set by the political system and, and to move in that direction. So very practically, because you always have to go from that words that I've just said to what actually does that mean. So for example, uh, each European member state has to set up an ACUS coordination group. So that brings together ministries, their agencies, farming organizations, farming media, um, a whole range of other players, agri-food processors, and people who are providing inputs into the agri-system and speak about how you can address this and work under a sort of a, an operational structure and a work program to actually deliver on exactly that point that you're saying, coherence, coordination, and, and being consultative with each other to, to deliver on the end game, which is the objectives around sustainability uh, in, in all its different forms and what it means in different parts of the country. Thank you very much. Kevin. Okay, I can just say as well that it, it's about bringing, as part of bringing those people together, but in practice as well, for example, at Farm Zero C, and Gavin is in the audience I see here, who's managing the project, um, you know, he brings a lot of people on tours of the farm, and they are not just farmers to actually explain to them what practices you can, you can actually put into, on the farm into practice, yeah? changes that you can put into practice. There's some low-hanging fruits, there's more uh, challenging ones, but when you bring different people together on a farm tour like that, you start to get them uh, talking to each other and understanding each other's language, and I think that's also part of getting consistent messaging, yeah? where you're bringing people into practice. I think that's really, really important. And it's an absolutely essential part, indeed, of the demonstration effect uh, that John was referring to and that we've all been discussing. Can you show the adjacencies in practice, test and learn, fail, learn quickly and learn from the failures and understand how does finance and insurance feed into this and how does the entire economic system change, indeed? I, I see it in a demonstration farm and it's a commercial demonstration farm, so I could do that on my farm. Or I'm already doing that on my farm and I'm doing it better. Uh, and here's how I'm doing it, yeah? So it's a two-way... Two nothing like the FOMO effect. Yeah. Okay, I am going to bring this to a close. Thank you very, very much indeed for listening. Thank you for your time. I think one thing I'd really wish to bring forward as you listen in, and I understand there's a question there, so we'll ask you perhaps to bring that to the next panel. You're going to hear today a series of living worked examples of trying this. I certainly think, speaking from, from, from the experience of servicing and supporting this work, this is not easy. This is difficult. On the other hand, this unleashes so much creativity, so much possibility, so much sense of connection to family, community, to a sense of possibility, and ultimately it really is about capturing imagination. How does the logic of the missions in, in Europe at the moment are just so much about getting our imaginations where we need to get there and connecting through all of the practical things on the ground that make that pathway possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John, for joining us. And, uh, Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, and to John Bell, Kevin O'Connor, and Patrick Barrett for that very interesting panel discussion. And I